Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It's really great to have you join this uh, alumni webinar. I'm Ted Snyder. I'm one of the uh, co-faculty directors of the Yale Initiative on Stakeholder Management. And I'm joined uh, here uh, on this seminar by John Awata and Nell Diamond. Maybe I'll just ask John to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm John. Uh, I, I'm a fellow at the School of Management, and along with Ted and Ravi Dar, Professor of Marketing, I have the pleasure of co-leading uh, this new program, which we'll be talking about today. And Nell Diamond, class of 2015. Nell, would you introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. So um, as was mentioned, I'm class of 2015, and I am the founder and CEO of Hill House Home, uh, which is a fashion and lifestyle business based in New York. Um, I came up with the idea for Hill House at SOM in the entrepreneurship program. So it's a real Hill, uh, real Hill House Avenue um, company. Now, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, it turns out that Nell just got back from Charleston, South Carolina, where uh, she and her team opened up a, a store. We'll hear more about the entrepreneurial venture later. Um, so uh, one of the things we want to do today is is get some data from you, and we're we're delighted to have uh, alumni and friends join this event. And uh, we have three questions, uh, two potential responses to each of the three questions, and um, the questions are as follows: uh, Do you believe that firms should follow the shareholder capitalism or the stakeholder? Mm -hmm capitalism model, which one? Uh, which model does your current or most recent employer follow, shareholder or stakeholder? And relevant to uh, some of the topics that we want to get into with now, should startups in the capital raising phase embrace stakeholder capitalism or should they focus on investors? Um, Embrace stakeholder capitalism is option A, focus on investors. And uh, I don't have to vote, um, but we invite everyone who's joining the uh, webinar to uh, to put in their votes and we will uh, tally, uh, tally those later and provide you with, uh, with the responses. So thank you for participating in some data gathering exercises. Um, The other thing I wanted to do is as we go through the discussion, um, I would invite you to submit questions. And uh, this is actually a great opportunity to say thank you to the team that uh, put together this event. And that's uh, Ben and Courtney and Angela. Thank you so much. Um, Angela, would you explain to uh, the participants how they can submit a question? Absolutely. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see mute, start video participants, and then down on the bottom bar, there will be a Q&A button. You click that and that is going to open up another web browser page and please feel free to submit questions that way. Terrific. Thank you. And John, let me, you know, we have multiple objectives today, one of which is to give people uh, a sense of what this new initiative is about um, and get into some depth around what you're learning from the CEO interviews that you've conducted. Uh, we do want to spend some time thinking about entrepreneurial ventures and we're, we'll uh, delve into those issues with Nell. And then uh, I will take you back to the classroom for uh, a little bit of uh, what, what John and I covered in the elective that we introduced uh, last fall. And um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and engagement. But our, our objectives are really to help you think through uh, what is your point of view about this important debate uh, around stakeholder and shareholder capitalism. We also, of course, do wanna bring you up to date on, on what's going on with the school and this initiative. Uh, and uh, with that, let me turn it over to John to talk through what is this new initiative, John? Thank you, Ted. Um, 
I have a few charts to share. Um, I, I should have mentioned and I, when I introduced myself, I, before becoming associated with the School of Management, I spent 35 years at IBM and a good deal of my career was spent on um, brand and strategy and stakeholder issues. So something that I'm familiar with in the, as a practitioner, and I brought that interest with me to, uh, to SOM. So the, this program, the Program on Stakeholder Innovation and Management, is fairly new. It was established in 2022, and it, it grew out of um, a line of inquiry that began in about 2019, just before the pandemic. And um, this issue is um, very much on the minds of CEOs, particularly in the United States. We began to talk to CEOs about this from the perspective of the how of stakeholder capitalism. It's one thing to be committed to the notion that we want to create value for customers and employees and investors and society and, and other stakeholders. In practice, um, it's very difficult to do that. We wanted to get under the covers of that to understand what, what would better prepare current and future leaders to be effective at this approach to management and to leading their, their both, both for-profit and for not-for-profit organizations. And out of these uh, interviews now, well over 150 of them, and we continue to do that, um, conduct the interviews, we identified some interesting examples. These, these have turned into case studies. And along the way, we also got some support from some of the CEOs we interviewed and others to establish this program formally a few years ago, as I mentioned. Uh, Ravi Dar joins Ted and, uh, and me in co-leading this, this program. We have a wonderful board of advisors made up of uh, some active and some former CEOs of some significant um, organizations. We really do rely on them. By the way, just yesterday, Lisa Sue who is the CEO of AMD, um, very successful turnaround. Now she's uh, taking AMD into the AI space, uh, came to the school to engage the students and it was a really nice, uh, nice opportunity. These are just a few of the names of the CEOs and uh, other leaders we've interviewed um, and some of the um, organizations they're, they're with or were with. Um, you'll notice that these are mostly U.S. based and these are mostly large established enterprises. You see some of the names here. Um, and I would say that they had a lot to say uh, about the how, the gaps, what could um, management and business schools um, teach that perhaps we're not teaching and so forth. I won't spend a lot of time on, on all of these, but if you just glance around some of the themes here, I'll touch on touch on them. There is very little debate among CEOs, at least the ones we we spoke with. These were at least one hour long interviews, uh, very, very conversation based about the 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 uh, rationale for it. They, they do believe that if you think about the long term sustainability and by sustainability, I don't just mean the climate climate aspects of it or the environmental aspects of it, but to build a good company, a great company. It does require, uh, or at least is helped by taking a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, so point number two, so many CEOs feel that they are expected, either they themselves or their brands are expected to speak out and take positions and actions on a vast array of societal issues. Uh, everything from immigration and reproductive rights to gun control and on and on. And the primary stakeholder group they identify as, as expecting this, um, I think 201, they begin with employees uh, to, of today and of tomorrow. That if you want to attract, retain, and engage that workforce, they expect to be a part, they want to be a part of, a, of an organization that does more than make money. And they also expect that organization at times to you know, speak out very difficult for the CEOs to determine what is material and what isn't. Related to that is point three on social license. This is not a new concept by any means. It comes out of the extractive industries like mining. 
But earning a social license today, it, it feels to many CEOs, whether they use that term or not, to be something they have to earn and, and retain. And that's becoming more of a challenge. Point four, without prompting, it's interesting how many CEOs start talking about purpose and values. Um, in fact, some of them say, I don't use the term stakeholder capitalism. I don't, some of them say, I don't understand it. I want to talk about purpose and values or mission and principles. I want to talk about why we exist and how, we, how we're going to behave, what our culture is going to be, what we stand for. And um, you'll notice here in point number four here, it's interesting looking back across these 150 or whatever interviews, when do they, when do they really lean into purpose and values and these why and the how and the what, these really first principle questions, it's particularly at when they're at founding and refounding moments. Founding is not just the startups. Um, a lot of companies are formed out of M&A activity. They're spun out. I mean, just look at General Electric turning into multiple companies. These are new companies, but they, they operate from day one at scale with large um, employee bases, customers, et cetera. And refounding moments are even more interesting, I think, because they, they find themselves at such a moment um, of a almost existential crisis or transformation, a very profound transformation. They feel like they have to not just uh, rebrand or reposition their companies, but actually refound them. And, and of course, purpose and values are fine, but they're just words unless you integrate them into what you actually do as a business. Um, if you want to, Point number five, it's one thing to say we want to have an impact on society, on people, et cetera, but very difficult to measure those things because these KPIs, metrics are non-standard, not standardized yet. They're soft, they're squishy, uh, they're, and so forth. So that's a, that's a challenge for them. And finally, um, how do you avoid what many of them call the tyranny of trade-offs you know, how, how do you avoid playing a, a zero sum game for customers, employees, and investors, and so forth? However, if you, if you frame the problem differently, if you frame the opportunity space differently, and then work differently, collaborate differently, um, they find um, it, it sometimes leads to new forms of value creation, call it innovation. And we find those to be very very interesting, and we've turned some of them into our case studies. Hence, our, our, the name of our program is Stakeholder Innovation, as well as Management. So that's a quick overview. Um, and of course, we can, we can get into this more if, if, if there's their interest. Thanks, John. And John probably understated uh, a little bit. His contributions to the initiative have been just amazing. His 35 years of experience at IBM holding you know, multiple C-suite jobs just uh, meant that when he joined Yale, he brought an amazing network that uh, he leveraged to, to get all these CEO interviews. And we're still uh, learning from, from what he's been able to, to do on that front. So thank you. So now let me, uh, l let me get you involved here. So uh, as John mentioned, the initial focus was was on big companies and 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 pretty much domestic companies but but as we got going we 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 sort of put a a note to ourselves and said we want to deal with entrepreneurial companies we also want to deal with non us companies and uh having you here gives us a chance to to focus a bit on the former um could you just give us a little background about your company, Hill House Home. Yes, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I started the business um, while I was at SOM. Um, we launched in 2016 and we spent the first few years bootstrapping the business. So focusing on profitability, um, taking it very slowly and, and trying to find product market fit. Um, and then about two years into the business, we started to see tremendous success in the women's fashion side of our business. Um, and that uh, attracted some investor interest. So we've now raised three rounds of uh, funding. 
from um, external investors and um, have built the business uh, quite significantly over the past couple of years. We had, um, I think it was three consecutive years of 300% year over year growth um, in a row. Uh, so it's been it's been quite a um, busy few years, but uh, I think the the first few years that were very slow um, prepared us for that. And and uh, you know, for those of you who want to go on on the website, you'll find some some dresses. Uh, maybe you just go a little more detail. Was that an important find that these nap dresses? Yeah, so um, we're probably most well known for a product called the nap dress, um, which is our word, our trademarked uh, phrase for um, a dress that has smocking. Um, and so smocking, for those of you who don't know women's fashion very well, it's stretchy. It means you, I could wear it when I was nine months pregnant with twins, as I was three years ago, um, but I could also wear it on a normal day with a blazer over it to a board meeting. Um, so our dresses are really known for their flexibility, both um, literal flexibility, but also in how you can wear them. Um, and they've they've done really well over the past couple of years as hybrid work has taken off. Um, and many women are looking for clothing that can kind of take them from the variety of different things that are going on in their day. So that's definitely our hero product. I'd say, um, you know, over 50% of our sales are in women's dresses. So not just nap dresses, but dresses in general. Um, and I never could have predicted that when we first started out. I, originally, I had anticipated it would be mostly a home company. So mostly focused on, you know, bedding, sheets, towels, those kinds of things. And while we still sell those, um, the significant growth in the business has been in the fashion side. Terrific. So, so maybe you could bear with me here. I mean, I could imagine um, in the startup phase, not even thinking about anything except raising capital, um, returns to owners, making sure that you're going to be profitable, and focusing on getting getting to uh, profitability as quickly as you can. I can also imagine that maybe some far-sighted startup entrepreneurs would would say, "Wait a minute! If I'm successful, I'm going to have to come up with a plan to that's more inclusive of of stakeholders." Where where, where were you and and during especially during that startup phase? Yeah, I mean, you might call it being idealistic, but I was full stakeholder mode. Um, I was entirely focused on figuring out a product market fit that would make our customers really feel that their purchase was worth it. And I remember saying kind of in the early days sitting at SOM, you know, if they tell me they absolutely hate this first product that I come out and they want us to sell, you know, t-shirts and our version of a t-shirt is the best t-shirt they've ever seen, then we'll pivot fully into that if that's what um, the, the market kind of tells us. And so I think that customer focus at the beginning, at the expense of probably short-term profits or short-term growth, was one of the best decisions we could have made. Um, I was definitely looking at it with this long-term lens and that idealistic, um, you know, kind of viewpoint, because I wanted to be doing this for a long time, and because I knew that um, I didn't want kind of a flash in the pan. And this was 2016, so you know, the direct-to-consumer businesses that were raising capital at that time were raising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and very much growth at all costs, venture capital, um, you know, low interest rate environment of let's put as much money as possible into Facebook market marketing, regardless of what the product actually is and stands for. And there's something about the way that I like to run my business that makes that very difficult for me. It's it's like this, you know, conscience thing that I can't sleep at night if I don't really feel like it's a product that I would use and wear. And so that made it easy for me to be really focused on stakeholders because I knew I couldn't get up every day and devote myself to this business if it wasn't product that I was really proud of. Uh, really helpful. Uh, now, what about um, your employees? Because, and maybe you could first identify how many do you have now? And um, just looping back to what John said, as, as we've gone through the process of engaging CEOs and identifying key stakeholders, along with customers, employees end up being very important. Both are in contractual relationships implicit in the case of 
customers explicit in the case of employees. But t tell us about you know your your experience with employees and and how you engaged them. Yeah. So, you know, similarly to the products and the growth of the business, the first couple of years, um, you know, we couldn't afford many employees. So I was the only employee for the first year or so. And then I kind of slowly began to hire people. Um, and actually all of my original employees who were with me in 2016 are still with me, which is one of the things that I'm most proud of in the business, um, being able to retain that talent and still, um, you know, they, they've really risen through the ranks um, and, and grown with the business. Um, I think about it, I think a lot like a hierarchy, right? So, you know, I had a couple of really tough decisions over the past couple of years. I had a new hire who came in in uh, 2021, a really good growth year for our business, sterling resume, incredible background, you know, awesome. You know, another, she went to another business school um, in Massachusetts and she was everything on paper. And it became pretty clear to me that she was also a really hard worker and, and you know, kind of good at her job. Um, but about six months into her being there, um, it became clear to me that the original employees that I had had real values misalignment with her. And I was, you know, put in a position where I had to decide, you know, is this something that's worth losing my original people for? And it wasn't. Um, and so we had to kind of end that that relationship. And, and that was a really tough kind of opportunity for me to figure out, right, where am I making these decisions here? Is it just for, um, you know, the growth of the business or are there other things that are important? And I think, again, it's that like being able to sleep at night thing for me. I knew that if my people who were truly in the trenches with me in, in the first couple of years were not able to come to work and feel supported and happy and, um, you know, heard that I wouldn't be able to run the business the best way I could. It's really interesting. I, I think, you know, if you just sort of visualize a two by two and say high performance and ability, low performance and ability, fit, not fit, that that off diagonal where you've got somebody who's very able, but is not a fit, that's the one that uh, keeps you up at night. And, and it's really an interesting story about the, the call that you made. Um, so, what have you written stuff down now, like a purpose statement, value statement, mission statement? Yeah, we've gone through a few different versions of of purpose and values. I think you know one of the interesting things about the list of you know CEOs that you guys talked to that you you showed a couple of slides ago. You know, many of those businesses are founder led, right? Like I think of Warby Parker, for example, and and Neil and Dave have d done such an incredible job at being so mission and values driven, um, and they're really able to because it's a founder led business. And I think that's I I've had the the great. Um, ease of having the mission and values so deeply in my bones and blood that it sometimes doesn't need to be written down. And as the business has matured, I've I've said to myself purposely, okay, it's time to write this stuff down because it's not as intuitive to the first you know fifty employees as it is to the first five. So, and then back to answer your question from earlier, we now have fifty five employees, um, but for years we had five. Um, we were stuck at five for for quite a while, and the difference between communicating those those values to the first five is is completely completely a different challenge um, and so making sure that as you mentioned you know we'll have five stores by the end of September a store employee who maybe has only met me once um, has only you know ever read about um, some of the things that we're doing in our corporate office how do we communicate to that retail employee the things that we actually stand for in our values is is something we're thinking about a lot one last question now you know you you were at SOM after the integrated curriculum was introduced. And, and for, for the alumni who are on the younger side, uh, you had that, that picture of the, the CEO and, and owners in the middle and then stakeholders arrayed around a circle. Uh, did, did that um, help you at all? What was the approach to uh, the integrated curriculum helpful to you as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I think that the integrated curriculum did something interesting for me that I kind of couldn't have anticipated, which was helped me also see 
not only myself, but the role of CEO as one that doesn't need to be defined so strictly, right? Like I think there are different flavors of CEOs. There are different choices that each leader makes. And so even this idea of, for me, I always say I was kind of a reluctant entrepreneur. I never thought of myself as an entrepreneurial person because I'm very risk averse. And I thought that didn't match up, right? And then I took the innovator class and that was like one of the most incredible classes that I, I've ever taken in, in all of my schooling because it really did challenge my assumptions about what an innovator really was um, and how you could be entrepreneurial and, you know, risk averse at the same time. So I think that, um, you know, figuring out what kind of CEO role each person is going to play um, and your dedication, your hierarchy, right? Like, is it customer first, employee first, where where, and when do you change those decisions um, is, is super important. So I lied. I was. I'm going to ask you yet another question. <laughs> so, um, you know, w- one of the things that John's summary highlighted is, you know, when when John's talked to CEOs and we've had CEOs uh, join us for different events, they've really grappled with what is the the proper set of things to to speak about, and and. Um, Maybe it's early, maybe it's not. Have you found yourself being asked to speak out on particular uh, social issues and they're therefore engage with more distant shareholder uh, stakeholders, excuse me? Constantly. And, you know, I've been back to Jeff Sonnenfeld's class quite a few times at SOM. And I think it's fa- he really pushes on CEOs with this question. And I think it's really fascinating to see how somebody who's in my role, right, like a founder led, you know, primarily founder owned business with some outside investors, but not certainly not a public company versus some of the public CEOs that he has come in there who have huge responsibilities to like massive groups of shareholders, the difference in the answers, right? I kind of have the luxury and freedom of being able to speak freely about what I think is important. And I have, um, and I have, and at the end of the day, I've had to kind of answer to investors, but really primarily to my employees and customers. And that's been the focus. So I think it's been interesting to see for the first time in you know the last 10 years, some of these CEOs of big public companies come out and say, you know, things that they never would have said, you know, decades ago, take really political stands. So I know from, from our perspective, you know, our 55 employees are all women, um, you know, abortion rights is something that's super important to us. We talk about that all the time. We support Planned Parenthood. Um, you know, we were very, very uh, vocal um, when when uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd happened and Black Lives Matter protests were happening all over the country in, in 2020. Um, so we've certainly been vocal, but I caveat that with the risk is much smaller for us, right? If I was to see of a big public company, I think it's a it's a different situation. Well, again, thanks so much, Nell, and and we wish you the continued success with Hill House Homes. Uh, and John, I don't know if you have any reactions. Um, I'm I'm going to ask uh, to get the survey results presented in a moment. But John, do you have any reactions to what what Nell said? Because you know, it, it might be I might be putting words in your mouth, but it seems like CEOs might be pulling back a bit on speech. They they are. I, I think uh, they're not pulling back on action. They're pu- they're pulling back, or rather, they're being much more judicious about when they are making statements um, because of the politicization of these issues. Um, it's quite a different. I think if we think about our what we heard back in 2020, 2021, you had Floyd, you had COVID, you had many things there, and then of late there have been very notable high profile uh, kind of blowback situations that have had material consequences. So I think um, they're being more thoughtful, but you know what? It's it's always should have been about actions that tie to the core of your business and your values. It shouldn't have been about tweets and things. And I think they're being um, more strategic, more, more authentic about it. One thing now, you might want to write down some of those things <laughs> because as you grow and grow, and no doubt you will, uh, people will be making decisions for you. And you'll wonder one day, I wouldn't have made that decision that way. And they were like, well, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I didn't know. And um, and the last thing I'll say is uh, we'd love to interview you formally for our, for our research too. 
I love that. Thank you. And don't worry, I have written them down. It just took me a couple of years to actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so do we have the results from the survey? I'm interested. Okay. All right. So uh, I find the first one pretty interesting, you know, and I, I suppose it, it may it, it may have an SOM uh, influence, but the stakeholder capitalism view uh, wins out uh, resoundingly um, four to one over shareholder view. But when it comes to uh, which model does your current or most recent employer follow, uh, it flips. So uh, there's a gap between, I think, what you believe in and what you actually experience as an employee. Um, and then the very last one, should startups in the capital raising phase embrace, let's see, do I control this? Yeah. Um, huh, interesting. So about two to, two to one, uh, start out as uh, with a stakeholder view. Even if you're an entrepreneur and capitalism is based on capital and uh, even, even in that context, uh, the participants here think it's important to embrace the stakeholder model. So with that, thank you for your uh, responses. And now uh, let me take you back to the classroom. Um, John and I introduced an elective uh, in the second half of fall 2023, it was a small elective. Um, there were virtually no PowerPoints. Um, I wrote some briefs. John gave some summaries of these interviews. And we, I think, were pretty disciplined where we we, we didn't have a point of view. We really, you know, a, a major objective of the class was to have students develop their points of view. And we started out with a question similar to question one, and we got most, most it turns out most of the students of a small class uh, said they, they embraced the stakeholder view. And then we revisited that question towards the end where students developed a personal statement and shared that personal statement with the class and I, John, I don't know if you disagree. It seemed to me that things shifted a bit. At least people were struggling with which model was right. Uh, and uh, it, it wasn't simply a yes or no, which one, but I think a, a greater appreciation for, for how difficult these questions are. John, I don't know if you have a comment. I agree. I agree, and, uh, and I, maybe I'll share a little bit about. I think part of the, you got them, you know, got them thinking that it's one thing. I mean, it's on the surface, it's very hard to to set aside the notion that a business ought to create value for its customers and its employees and society. Um, but as we walk through it, it's um, it's uh, it's either well, that's called stake. That's called shareholder capitalism. <laughs> that's what. That's what you should be doing anyway. On the other hand, it's it's not so straightforward. It's not so easy. Yeah, let me pick up on John's last point. It's not so not so straightforward. I was actually a student of Milton Friedman, probably one of the few people who are still active teaching who had Milton as a professor. And um, if you take Milton's views narrowly and say, here's the shareholder model, it looks, it looks like it's very different from the stakeholder model. But if you modernize the shareholder model, and uh, our initiative had an academic camp uh, just, just a week ago, there, there's a, a version of the shareholder model that's called instrumental shareholder capitalism, where even profit-oriented uh, owners and managers will take into account uh, the values and beliefs of employees and customers and others. 
so it it turns out that the more modern view of being profit maximizing doesn't mean that you ignore those those values and interests. You take them into account, but you do it because it's in your long run self interest. So uh, Nell brought up a really interesting point that she hasn't lost employees. Well, that's that's cost saving. People want to work for for this this enterprise, and customers to the extent that they understand the values and internalize them, that they're willing to pay more and buy more. So this is what makes it inherently, in my mind, ambiguous as to whether there's just one equation, profits are a function of these things and you're maximizing that, or are there multiple equations, multiple objectives? Um, because when you look at the right-hand side of the profit equation, for those of you who spent time with the brief, it turns out what your employees think about uh, the, the enterprise and what your customers think beyond just prices and wages ends up being something that you optimize on. So uh, it, it was interesting uh, to me that, that when the uh, topic of, uh, for this webinar first popped up, the suggestion was, well, maybe a good topic would be, is stakeholder capitalism still going to be the future? And I'm not even sure it's the present. When I actually look at at uh, at, at, at what's what's happening, and we had uh, Jane Sun, who's on the board, contribute to the class. John brought in a, a person, a senior executive from Target, we, to focus on design thinking. Um, we had uh, Paul Pullman, former uh, CEO of uh, Unilever, and, and we had Indra Nui, former CEO of Pepsi. And what's interesting to me is when you when when we got to the student uh, summaries, their personal points of view, both those who favored stakeholder capitalism, both those who, and, and those who favored shareholder capitalism cited Indra in support of their views. Because she she had uh, uh, developed a, a compelling strategy that engaged especially the the uh, stakeholders with whom the company was in contractual relationships, and said let's make money differently. Let's focus on the how, and that engaged suppliers, that engaged employees, and uh, and to the extent that I think customers were aware of it, it also uh, engaged customers. So uh, I, I found that um, pretty interesting. Um, in the time that, that I wanna spend on the class, I, I do wanna just suggest a diagram, and this is you know admittedly getting a little geeky, but this is a diagram that we came back to again and again in the class. So back to the classroom. Um, some of you may remember when you took econ for the first time, there was something called the production possibility frontier. And the boundary of the PPF uh, identified what you could do, the, the, the maximum you could do when it comes to combinations in this context of profits and social goods. So profits on the vertical axis, um, social goods on the horizontal axis. And the area that's highlighted in yellow and represents trade-off. There's a negative relationship between profits, which peak at maximum profits, and, um, and social goods. So the, the class, I think, and I think managers um, sort of resist this idea of a trade-off. And therein lies, I think, one of the goals of the initiative, which is to come up with insights about how managers can shift out the production possibility frontier. Instead of moving along it in a negative way, is there a way to push that frontier out? 
and design thinking is is one possibility. Uh, and uh, I think there's some people who, well, there's a distribution of views about design thinking. Some people are, think it's always available or nearly always, always available. Others are more skeptical. Um, but I think that's one tool to get the production possibility frontier shifted out so that there's not an inherent trade-off between profits and social good. Now, the other uh, management technique, and John mentioned key moments, founding and refounding, and maybe uh, appointment of new CEOs, and maybe it's crises, but there, there may be times when the CEO really has the ability to engage a set of stakeholders at the same time and find out if there are ways that improve their engagement so that instead of the trade-off, you get the positive. And this is this is where um this is what's anchored in the diagram on the left-hand side. Uh, this point here, profits with social goods equals zero. It may be that actually by doing good, you trace along a positive part of the production possibility frontier and end up having greater profits because of instrumental uh, shareholder capitalism, you're getting more commitment from your employees. You're getting more buy-in from your customers and other uh, stakeholders such as suppliers uh, and uh, partners, technology partners, et cetera. So here's a here's a positive part of the curve, and and what what we're trying to figure out a little bit with the case studies is how 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 do CEOs exploit this? When do they exploit it? What's what's the communication strategy? And I must say I think uh, you know for those of you who've heard Indra, she she really I think worked this process in a way that, that was uh, really compelling. So it's quite a shift from the old days. Uh, and you know, I had the pleasure of getting to know Jack Welch and I thought he was a terrific CEO. And you know, Jack Jack's idea was, well, if we make money, then we pay our employees, we pay taxes, uh, we, we thereby support the community and we serve our customers and we return uh, profits to our shareholders. And that's the purpose. I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but I think it's a much more complicated environment today. Um, and I think that's sort of where, where we're going, not only with the class, but with the initiative, trying to understand the management techniques uh, that um, are emerging and seeing how, how they are actually implemented. John, do you have any comments on my... Uh, production possibility frontier and, and what we're learning? <laughs> well, <clears throat> we came back to this quite a few times during the class with the students uh, last fall, and it did a lot of work getting them to think hard. I think the part that I I think we see in our, in our research through the program is what you said earlier, Ted, which is could, can we push out the opportunity space here? Can we push that curve out through different approaches, call it innovation? And um, I'll just say one more thing here. I, I, I think design, um, if, if design as practice today could be evolved, um, it might be a tool for management to use. I'm talking about design very broadly. Design is problems, problem framing and problem solving. Um, now you're into design, uh, your business is design-based. I spend time in design at IBM and also I'm in the chair of the Cooper Hewitt. So, you know, I keep my finger on the pulse of designers and design. And I think that a lot of them would feel that a, a purely user-centered design or a human-centered design, which is the prevailing practice, actually is not very helpful. It's actually the opposite. <laughs> of what you might want to use if you're trying to solve for the and. Because user-centered design trains you to have 
to take friction out, <laughs> to take anything away from that experience that delights the quote user. But in a stakeholder frame, you have to account for sustainability. You have to account for manufacturability. You have to account for wages and and um, and and profits and you know and the consumer or the customer. And how do you solve simultaneously? And this is confounding the businesses because businesses are organized vertically and processes are sequential. So um, design isn't this is the only answer, but it may it may be uh, if it changes, if it evolves, it could be. Uh, it could be useful. Yeah, just to uh, wrap up on the on the class and more broadly, I think one of the things that I was heartened by is that the among the current students, they want to come up with a, a point of view, um, and the CEOs and the C-suite executives they want to uh, grapple with these issues. So I, I think there's a really strong audience both in, among current students and more senior people for the initiative. And um, I think it's it's important for us to, to keep pushing hard on, on the how. And um, thanks to uh, everybody who's sort of putting their shoulder to the wheel, I think we're, we're making some progress. Um, now I'm gonna open it up for questions in a moment, but do you have any comments on on what, what you heard from John and, and uh, myself about the class? Yeah, I mean, I I think that I think that design piece is just fascinating. I think um, you know feedback is so important in my industry, right? Customer feedback on fit and style and all of these different things, how people are using things. But this idea that like purely user driven is is never going to get you what you want is actually like kind of the key to um, art, right? And moving forward in the world. And if people were just always making what other people wanted, it would be like art of consensus versus art that like truly pushed us forward. And so I think it's, it's, I just keep, even with the graph, I keep just thinking that there's this like sweet spot where maybe all of them converge, right. And, and come together. Um, and, uh, you're able to kind of maximize benefits. Um, it's almost like kind of constantly pushing for that equilibrium where you're maximizing benefits on, on both ends. Excellent. So, uh, I, I can see that we have some questions and answers. I don't know if Courtney or if you would uh, help us uh, with identifying questions and we'll we'll take a few. Uh, sure, happy to. Um, our first question uh, is from Athan uh, Sheikh. Uh, how do you think views between stakeholder and shareholder capitalism differ across industries? Coming from healthcare, while our shareholders are important, Without a broader focus on wider stakeholders, there is a long-term risk of losing patient and HCP trust that would ultimately impact the bottom line. Well, let, let me just mention one thing that I think is important. Um, when products are differentiated, whether it's high tech or low tech, home goods or um, durable goods, whatever, there's, I think there's more room for stakeholder capitalism. And why is that? Well, because the companies are differentiated, there's a potential matching process between customers, employees, investors, and others to companies based on their particular profile. And you can get uh, an outcome where companies with different approaches to stakeholders, some might one company one might be pure shareholder, another company might be much more stakeholder in orientation, but because they're differentiated, they can both survive and potentially prosper. Uh, an example would be Walmart and Costco. They're, they're viewed as being pretty different in terms of how, uh, of the in terms of which model they they pursue. So that's one one way to answer the question. Let's keep going with some questions. Courtney? Sure. Our next question is from Tony Sheldon. Nell, have you considered registering as a B corporation? If so, what are your thoughts on pros and cons? Oh, you're on mute, uh, Nell. We lost sorry, you. Sorry, sorry. Um, 
you know, I haven't looked into it recently enough to to answer that fully. I know. So when I was in the entrepreneurship program at SOM, there was um, a company uh, that was making uh, shirts uh, like like business shirts that registered as a B corporation. I remember looking into it at that time, um, but I have not I have not looked back into it mostly because we've been you know so de- defensive on on the growth um, for the past couple of years. But it is something that um, we've been thinking through whether we should look into again. If I just thanks Tony for that question. Yeah, we among the CEOs we interviewed, um, they were CEOs of B corporations. I think they include, I I may be mistaken, I think they include Warby Parker, Vital Farms, the egg company, and um, Allbirds, the shoe company. And I have to say, I did not detect any differences in what they shared with us. They still feel they have to deliver for investors and customers and employees and society. And I didn't, maybe we should have asked more deliberately. I didn't feel like they were liberated from some of the responsibilities, expectations and pressures from uh, from the CEOs of say public corporations. Yeah, Warby, Warby's a B Corp and a public, you know, publicly traded company. So it's, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Great, Courtney, let's keep the questions going. Next question is from Michael Golden. How is this program looking at the question of board responsibility on a legal basis? This ties to the B Corporation laws in various states, and I do piece, I do employee ownership. Um, how the board responds to conflicts, particularly uninvited acquisition offers? Well, I have a comment. Uh, others might as well. I think this touches on a, an issue. Um, that, that is getting a lot of attention both from people in business and, and more policy people and, and some academics, which is if, if, if the managers move away from profit maximization as the thing that they focus on and report on, then how does the board actually evaluate performance? And what happens if you end up having like five things on the scorecard and four of them are fairly unique to that company because there's no agreement on how to how to you know what to select and how to measure. So there's some concern that uh, if we move to a, a full-throated shareholder, excuse me, t- stakeholder model, that it'll actually make boards um, it'll put boards in a more challenging position. And one virtue of the of the shareholder model is its simplicity. Um, John Nell. Um, so I happen to have a, a. I'll just flash this up because the only part of that famous essay that Milton Friedman wrote in 1970 that's often quoted is where he says the one and only purpose is to maximize profits because that's what the owners want. But he also wrote this in that same essay, which is, you know, you you do what the owners want you to do, and it's usually to make them a lot of money. But notice in blue, he says, of course, in some cases, his employers, that is the shareholders, may have a different objective. So if you think about the fiduciary responsibility, which is, you know, a legal thing, right, which is inherent in many of the questions here, the question is, you have a fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the shareholders. What do the shareholders want? Well, maybe in 1970, you know, it was the case that the majority of shareholders wanted maximization of value for them. But with the rise of ESG investing, with the rise of whatever you want to call it, whether it's ESG or impact or sustainability, um, one has to wonder, it was a legitimate question, but does fiduciary responsibility actually now mean we have to incorporate or integrate these other non-financial goals into what the, we hold management accountable for? So it's not a slipping away from, from fiduciary responsibility. It's actually in furtherance of it, if in fact you you, 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 we could, we could see that this has changed. That, that you know, investors want different things. 
Let's totally agree on that. I think, yeah, the, the maximization of profits and growth at all costs, we've seen enough companies really fail that way over the past, you know, many cycles over the past kind of 50 years. And so I think that there's a lot more gray area for what that, um, you know, fiduciary responsibility actually um, might mean. Yeah, the context here of, you know, big, big issues hitting society, you know, it, it's bound to come up. It's just, it's, so, but let's keep going. Courtney, more question? Yeah, our next question is from Philip Davis. Uh, John, are you seeing impact from the backlash from the Supreme Court affirmative action decision? Some state legislators are seeing an opening to roll back DEI stakeholder capitalism for corporations. Um, Phil, I, I think it relates to this larger issue of ESG. Um, you know, we've all read enough articles, you know, ESG is now, a, 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 you know, can't talk about it. <laughs> uh, we've heard that companies are literally renaming their ESG reports, impact reports. They're doing away with ESG committees and, and things like that. The question is whether we're, whatever the Supreme Court does and whatever legislators do and however politicized, the question is whether companies are changing what they're actually doing. We haven't seen that. We, we, we haven't seen a decommit to DE&I. We haven't seen a decommit to, to aspects of climate change or sustainability that's right for their businesses. What we have seen is they don't want to get in this crossfire. They don't want to be used to as part of some other you know, fight. Um, you know, again, that's all anecdotal. It's based on the people that we're talking to. Um, we have seen some studies that would be in line with that. But, um, you know, specific to your question, I don't have a response, but I would say if you roll it up to this bigger topic, that's what we, we see happening. Courtney, one more maybe? Next question is from Ivan. If the part of the stakeholder capitalism model is truly taking into account the value delivered to stakeholders and internalizing profit resulting from relationships with those stakeholders. Do academic and corporate research efforts that aim at revealing and quantifying these relations play a crucial role in educating business pr practitioners? Could, could, could you repeat the very last part, Courtney? Yes. Um, do academic and corporate research efforts that aim at revealing and quantifying these relations play a crucial role in educating business practitioners? Yeah, I think the short answer to that one is, uh, and by the way, that's just a great question. Um, we understand the idea uh, that, that uh, employees who feel some affinity for the firm's purpose and values are more likely to, to work for that firm, stay with that firm, even accept somewhat lower wages. But the quantification I think is has not been done. We had, we I mentioned we had the academic camp and there's there are beginnings of research that look at, is there a way to quantify how purposeful a company is and aspects of its performance? But I think that question actually is a better question because it gets at exactly how much is our consumers willing to pay to buy a, a product that has more social good associated with it? How much are potential employees willing to value uh, the same kind of relationship when they decide whether to work for a company? And we don't, to my knowledge, we don't have good studies on that central issue, which, which I think is really important because if those are substantial, looping back to one of the findings, I think for me, uh, if they're substantial, the shareholder and stakeholder views are going to end up converging to a great extent, underscored by the point that John mentioned earlier about social license. Um, so the, the academic debate may fall with better answers to the question posed. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. I wanted to thank especially Nell uh, for, for hustling back from the, her store opening in Charleston uh, for joining us. It really added a lot to our discussion. I wanted to thank John, my, my faculty colleague on this initiative. Again, wanted to thank everyone who joined today for the questions. 
And also thanks again to the staff for putting this together. We hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.